Hi, everybody. My name is Dan Davenport. Welcome and thank you for taking time. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, we're here to talk today about employment branding, uh, which is a, a workforce discipline that's growing in importance and certainly one that we believe is going to continue to grow in importance as we look towards the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, and I think if you're an organization that is interested in recruiting and retaining not just top talent, but talent, so those A, those B candidates, this is going to be a discipline and, and, a, and a, um, uh, a function of your workforce that's going to be of interest to you. My name is Dan Davenport, uh, but first I'd like to introduce Heidi Green. Heidi Green is my co-host for the presentation today, and frankly, she's really the employment branding expert in the group. Um, Heidi is the Vice President of Marketing for Brightmove, uh, a really well-positioned and, and uh, extremely innovative recruiting software company, if you guys don't know them. Uh, say hello, Heidi. Hi, everyone. Thank you Go for ahead. joining us today. There you go. <laughs> Heidi has over 10 years of experience in marketing and branding, and, and she really has a focus on employment branding. She's focused on internal communication throughout her career and certainly company culture initiatives. So I'm excited to work with Heidi on this presentation and hear a lot of the good information that she has to tell us in just a moment. Uh, my name is Dan Davenport. Uh, for the previous four years now, I've been a marketing consultant working in and around the workforce uh, solutions industry. Prior to that, I was the vice president of global marketing for Pontoon, um, and before that, I was the chief marketing officer for a company on the West Coast by the name of Pacific Life. Uh, one of the things that you'll find that Heidi and I have in common is we really enjoy our work, and we like to have a good time. Um, so when we decided that we were going to put on a presentation about employment branding, um, we thought what better way to do that than to look to the future and try to make some predictions about what the future workforce is going to look like and what the future worker is going to look like. And what better way to do that than to really introduce you to who we believe is going to be the real George Jetson. Um, but before we meet the real George Jetson, for some of you uh, younger folks out there, um, let me tell you who the original George Jetson was. The Jetsons uh, it was a cartoon developed in 1962 by Hanna-Barbera. Um, it only was aired for three seasons, so 62, 63, and 64 um, on live, uh, or live uh, cartoons, um, or first-run cartoons, I should say. But the, the program itself ran all the way until 1987. Uh, George, uh, as was described uh, um, by the Jetsons, lived in the Sky Pet Apartments with his family and his dog, Astro. Um, he had all the pleasures of modern life in 2062, so about 40 years from now. Um, they drove a flying saucer-like car. They had moving sidewalks. They had robot assistants. But specific to what we're interested in, George's job description um, is what I'm going to get into now. So he worked at Spacely Sprockets, which was a manufacturer of high-tech equipment. Uh, his title was Digital Index Operator. His boss was Cosmo Spacely. Uh, and his job description and his primary responsibilities included him pushing a button a single time repeatedly through the course of the day. The computer that he operated was named Rudy. Um, and, uh, and George complained about how busy he was, sometimes having to hit the button five or six times through the course of a three-hour workday or three hours of a three-hour work week. George was an average man. Um, he had trouble with his boss. He had problems with his kids. The only difference was at the time uh, he lived 100 years in the future when the Jetsons were created in 1962. Interestingly enough, um, the Jetsons, just to give you a little bit more history about the cartoon itself, the Jetsons was, uh, was created as a complementary program to the already wildly successful Flintstones, which was obviously a look into the past, uh, which was also aired from 1960 to 1966. So what was interesting for us from a first look, right, uh, and, and from our perspective is let's look at at the time the Jetsons was created in 1962, what was workforce, what was our, our workforce like at the time? Um, so some, some bullets here that we can talk through. Uh, in 1962, most workers began their careers at age 18, some even as early as age 16. Um, 
work, they worked for one company typically throughout their career. So their 40 plus year career with one organization and the company really defined their career. Retirement was at 62 and a half. Most people retired with a lifetime and pension, lifetime insurance from the company that they worked for and certainly a gold watch. He was a he in 1962 as only 37% of women worked. Um, and he was not uh, college educated as at the time only about 11% of men and 6% of women were. Most jobs in the United States, 70% to be exact in the 1960s were blue collar. And the average age of the US worker in 1962 was 40. This was before a rapid decline in age in the 70s and 80s. So at the time that Jetsons was created, this is what the workforce looked like. The next thing that was interesting to us was to say, let's look at the workforce today. We typically today begin our careers at age 22. Um, we're more educated than we were in, in the 1960s. We tend to work for as many as 15 companies now and define our own careers. Um, we'll likely work for, into our late 60s and early 70s before we rely on the government and personal savings and income for our future funding and health insurance. The he-she split of our workforce is more balanced, about 60, 40 men to women. And our jobs have completely shifted from blue collar work in 1962 to white collar work today with 80%, 86% of the US jobs being white collar. More than a third of men and women in the United States are college educated with a four year degree. Um, and we've expanded our employment to include contracting, consulting, job sharing, remote gig work, freelancers, and as many as 30 to 40% of us claim to be in that type of working environment today. So something that's dramatically different than where it was in 1962. And the question then comes to what is it going to be in the future? How is this trend going to continue for us? So we've made some predictions as to what the real workforce of 1962 may look like. We believe that our workforce is going to continue to get education and become more specialized, that careers are not going to begin at 22, that they'll grow later in life and start at 24 plus. We will be a much more highly specialized workforce at this time, uh, and we'll continue to acquire vertical skills throughout our career. Um, we'll, be, we'll be, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll, be, uh, we'll be champion for our ability to adapt, um, adapting to, uh, to change in technology, adapting to change in workforce environments is going to be part of what labels our success throughout our careers. We'll work for many companies, uh, and work obviously in many different capacities in, 19, in uh, 2062, but we believe that people are going to identify with one or two organizations and work for those organizations as, a, as or use those organizations as a satellite throughout their career. We will serve as satellites to those organizations throughout their career. Companies that we believe in their culture, we believe in their brand, we believe in their value systems, will continue to work for in multiple capacities. So maybe we'll start as an employee, of that organization, we'll leave and become a consultant later in life, we'll do projects for them, we'll continue to circle back to that organization and work in different capacities depending on where we are in our own careers at that point in time. Location will be irrelevant. Um, working relationships will certainly vary, as I said, and the working from home as we're doing today will continue to be or will grow into the norm at that point in time. Retirement will be much less a term um, and we'll continue to work in different capacities as we evolve throughout our lives. Gray collar work is what we believe is going to be the, the, the most popular work of the day. And gray collar is a term that's out there today, but we believe it's a term that's gonna to continue to define itself and continue to change over time. Somebody who's highly skilled, highly trained, highly educated, and is able to use those skills to actually create product. And by product, we mean software, tech, infrastructure, um, but we're going to be a lot more of a hands-on workforce at that point in time. We're going to help uh, our careers are going to continue to be defined, or we're going to work for organizations in those capacities where culture, benefits, performance-based pay, and corporate social responsibility um, are, are aligned with our value systems, and that's going to continue to play a role in that working relationship. So with that being said, um, we've got a hypothesis to share with you as to what the work or, or what and how employer branding is gonna play a role. And then I'm gonna introduce Heidi, who's gonna talk to you a little bit about what that means. So the hypothesis being, we're gonna see a tremendous increase in employment loyalty from both the employer and the employee. 
This is something that's dramatically different than where we are today. In fact, it's something that gets you closer back to where we were in 1962, except I don't believe we'll be relying on gold watches and pensions to create that loyalty anymore. Instead, we're going to be uh, relying on the, uh, the culture of an organization, the marketing of the organization in terms of their employer branding, their value system, and how closely it aligns to us. So as we discussed, using um, the values, uh, the value system and projecting that through employer branding to help us create satellites as an employer of employees who are going to spend time with us in different capacities throughout their career. As organizations will continue today, this is, I believe is true, and it's going to continue to be relevant as time goes by, we're no longer the buyers of talent, but we're instead the sellers of careers. And as sellers, companies, uh, those companies in that time will need to embrace this shift um, and those that, that will be successful will embrace recruiting and employer branding um, to continue to grow their business and to grow their staff in a competitive environment. Uh, Cosmo, uh, so going back to the Jetsons and tying this all back together before I introduce Heidi, um, uh, Cosmo basically faced fierce competition in the Jetsons from his competition, which was Cogwell Cogs. Um, it was, it was uh, and it wasn't just consumer competition, it was competition for the services of George himself. So what made Cosmo successful? Why did George stay? We're going to get into answering those questions for you here today. And then at the end, we're going to introduce you to the future George or the real George Jetson. I think with that, Heidi, I'd like to turn it over to you to talk a little bit about employer branding. Thanks, Dan. That was very informative. So the rise of employer branding is really happening now. The phrase was first coined in 1990 and Employer branding is defined as the process of managing and influencing your reputation as an employer among job seekers, employees, and key stakeholders. It encompasses everything you do to position your organization as an employer of choice. An employer brand includes an employee value proposition, which is a promise to employees, and we will talk more about that later. But right now, employer branding is super important, even with the shift in the economy and all of the unemployed people, they are going to be looking for organizations with great employer brands when they get back to their job search and companies start hiring. Some examples of companies with great employer brands and employee value propositions are HubSpot, we're building a company people love, a company that will stand the test of time. So we invest in our people and optimize for your long-term happiness. Goldman Sachs, at Goldman Sachs, you will make an impact. And at Target, oh, what fun, hop in. So the re the reason why employer branding is so important is because it affects the recruitment of new employees. It affects the retention of current employees. It affects the feelings of alumni employees. And those are employees that have left your organization for one reason or another. They're now an alumni. And as we um, perceive all of these different things in the organizations in the market, um, employer branding is how everyone views you. So when they first hear about you or someone first tells you about you or you first research your organization online, if you're a prospective candidate, it all comes back to employer branding. And something very important to note is you don't own your employer brand, you only manage it. This is a super important point. Um, many people today are saying you need to start working on your employer branding. You need to start getting your employer brand in order. Well, I hate to tell you that your employer brand is already out there. Your employer brand is what people think of you today. It's how they talk about you today. You can't do anything to, with a fresh start to tell them what you want them to think, but you can start changing your employer brand by managing it in a more positive way and we'll get into some tactics on how you can start to manage your employer brand. So we have some stats for you. 
So 78% of candidates say the overall candidate experience they get is an indicator of how a company values its people. Eighty-four percent of job seekers say the reputation of a company as an employer is important. So eighty-four percent of people will really take into consideration your company's reputation. Nine out of ten candidates would apply for a job when it's from an employer brand that's actively maintained. So really managing and maintaining your employer brand is very important to nine out of 10 candidates. 69% of candidates would reject an offer from a company with a bad employer brand, even if they were unemployed. This is going to be super important coming up as the economy starts to ramp back up after COVID um, realize that 69% of candidates will not take your job if you have a bad employer brand. Employee turnover can be reduced by 28% by investing in employer branding. And we know that it's costly to hire new employees. So if you can reduce turnover and attrition, that would be great for your brand. So another reason to invest in employer branding. 85% of women and 67% of men in the U.S. wouldn't join a company with a bad reputation. So that's powerful. What people say about you online is important to candidates and equally as important how you respond to those, you know, negative comments or even positive comments. You need to always be responding whether it's positive or negative with transparent and honest information. Sixty-four percent of consumers have stopped purchasing a brand after hearing news of that company's poor employee treatment. I think we have several stories just from this COVID time that we can all think back to, but Dan has a story that he'd like to share from his personal experience. Oh, hey, thanks. So when, when and I had given you guys a little bit of my career earlier on, but um, when I had first started working in the workforce solutions industry, I had an opportunity to meet with a, um, a, a very large and successful um, uh, sneaker manufacturer uh, and talk to them about their recruiting process um, and, and, and specifically look at the length that they went to um, to, to VIP their recruiters, to take good care of them. They put a concierge in charge of every recruit that they were talking to. They flew, um, they flew individuals that were uh, not from the location out to the facility, um, made arrangements for their hotel, really went above and beyond to take care of the recruits. So I had asked the question, not being from the industry, um, and wanting to understand from this leader why they went to such, uh, such lengths and certainly to such um, uh, costs to take care of each recruit and, and, and also learning that for each position that they were publishing at the time for or looking to fill, they had 80 and 90 individuals applying. Um, and the answer I got back was, you know, because we have 80 or 90 people applying for every position that we look to fill, we have to tell 79 people I'm sorry, you're not good enough to work here, but would you still please buy shoes from us, right? And it really hit home at that point just how important it is to take care of your, um, your, your employer brand uh, and specifically to project that out into your, into your talent pool and into your talent community because they're not just looking to work for you, they're also potentially purchasers of your product or in more cases or more, uh, uh, more obvious cases, influencers of who may work for be the next person to apply for a position with you. Yeah, Dan, that's a great point. And I think that story really hits home. It's the way you treat your candidates or your employees 
people are going to hear about that. And if it's negative, you are going to lose consumers or prospective employees. So you really need to try to do everything you can to make it a positive experience. 79% of job applicants use social media in their job search. And 76% of companies choose social media to communicate employer brand. So this is very important. Um, candidates are going to look you up on social media and see if you are investing in your employer brand. People will be talking about your organization on social media, whether you're engaged in the conversation or not, it's better to be engaged in the conversation so that the prospective employees and candidates can see your perspective as long as it's honest and transparent and truthful and that you are responding and you are engaging. And media is a great way to showcase your employer brand. There's so much you can do on social media that you don't even need to pay for. I mean, some companies choose to promote posts and do things on LinkedIn to attract candidates through paid advertising, but it's not really necessary as long as you post pictures and post videos and you really tell stories about your employees and the impact that your organization has on others, you'll find a lot of success using social media organically. So some strategies and tactics to manage your employer brand. So first you need to commit to employer branding. You need to have a dedicated person who's responsible responsible and you need to gain executive buy-in and support. Passing different responsibilities off between different people that it's going to be done isn't going to work. It needs to be a high priority for one person and if they need a team of people, which eventually they probably will, then that team is responsible for it, but it can't be another thing added to someone's job description. It has to have a lot of focus, attention, and detail. And making sure that the executives know why you're doing it and they support why you're doing it is very important. If they think that you're wasting your time and they don't understand the impacts of employer branding, then you're not going to be successful and your outcomes of employer branding aren't going to be successful. Um, it's also important because CEOs and other executives have a lot of visibility into employer brand, um, prospective candidates, current employees, they're going to want answers from the executives. So you're going to be that go between person to get those answers and communicate transparently and authentically with both parties. Um, you need to do your research. You need to first find out what people think about your organization. You need to hold internal focus groups to think about what your current employees think about you. You need to contact former employees and think about what they thought working there, why they left, what first attracted them to your organization. You need to ask candidates during interviews why they're interviewing there and why they're interested in your organization. And you need to read online review sites about yourself and you need to respond, whether it's a positive review or a negative review or a neutral review, you must respond. It must be authentic, it must be genuine, and it must be sincere. Don't type some corporate speak. Make sure that you are direct and it's real because that's what people care about when looking at your employer brand. Um, also, I mentioned that you need your employee value proposition. So that's a promise you make for employees, but also, what do you expect from your employees? That's usually in there too. Um, you need to create a strategy. So define goals, come up with your candidate personas, figure out the channels and distribution methods for your employer brand. Is it gonna be on all social media channels? Is it going to be on a few? Is it gonna be on Glassdoor? Are you gonna send out you know, collateral inner office, um, which, won't really happen because we don't have offices, but through the mail to employees' houses, how are you going to communicate your employer brand to everyone? You need to identify candidate touch points during the recruitment cycle where you can position your employer branding positively and reinforce it. You need to identify the certain tactics that you're gonna use. Are you gonna use video? Are you gonna use a 
blog posts? Are you going to take blog posts from employees and just post them? Like, what are you going to do? You need to figure that out. And you need to use the research that you've conducted to drive your employee value proposition and your strategy in order to make this all flow together. They all work together. If you try to do one part without doing the research or you try to try to do the research and then not follow through with the step strategy based on that research, it's not going to work. So some things that you need to consider, um, your career site. When looking for jobs, one of the first places a prospective employee is going to go is your career site. Does it have information? Does it portray your employer brand? Can they easily find out about your employer brand? Can they see testimonials from workers? Can they really see a day in the life of what it's like to work there? If it's just a boring blank page with, hey, we'd love for you to apply to work here, that's really not going to gain much interest. Um, also, if you have an ATS, make sure that your portal is branded like Brightman portals are so that it looks like it's part of your career site so that people feel comfortable submitting their information because they know where it's going. Um, highlight your employer value prep proposition on your website. Highlight what makes you unique, um, your special benefits or programs, what you do for rewards and recognition, how your culture is, what your views on social corporate responsibility are, some things that you might do. Maybe you have two volunteer days a year that every employee gets to pick an organization where they get to spend two days. Um, really iterate your mission values and vision on this career site page so that everyone knows up front what you're about. Um, make sure that your candidate experience is flawless and engaging and it makes people want to work there. For example, if I apply for a job through your ATS, I don't want to think it's a black hole. I want to hear from the recruiter. I want to hear, yes, I received your application. This is what's happening next. And if you have too many applicants where you just can't make that personal connection, even though you really should try, just an automated email or a text would say, thank you for applying. We have your information. This is the next step. Just try to make sure that you keep it personal and you keep the human side. Don't make everything try to be automatic. Um, again, make sure the ATS isn't a black hole. Like things don't just go into the ATS and disappear. That's not how it works. There's ways that you can set up your ATS to send out automated information. So candidates know where they are in the pipeline at all times and what to expect next. Keeping in communication is super important. I know that I keep mentioning that. Make the application short. No one wants to fill out five pages of information for a job. Maybe all you need to do is get their first name, last name, email, and the job that they're applying for, and then have someone contact them to get the rest of their information. Your organization can decide how much information you need initially, but the shorter, the better, and the higher number of candidates you will receive. Um, again, think about your content and your distribution channels. We kind of talked about that earlier, but especially for candidates, what content are you going to put out to attract candidates? And even to retain employees, what are you going to do? And I highly recommend an employee advocacy or employee ambassador program. And I don't mean one of those things that you look for online, like a portal that says that it will do it for you. They're going to craft all these messages and all your employees have to do is hit the share button. No, that is not what I'm talking about. I am talking about an authentic, real employee ambassador program. You have to trust your employees. And of course, there's ways to monitor this, but trust your employees, let them tweet about what's going on within the organization, let them share their feelings, let them share their thoughts, and use your hashtag that you come up with for your employee ambassadors and you will gain so much traction on your employer brand because people will begin to follow that and see all of the cool things that your organization does and it will attract new candidates. 
Um, but really, please stay away from those other force-fed messaging systems. That's not the point of employee advocacy or being an employee ambassador. Create your own, make it organic. Um, obviously, most people know what they should and shouldn't do. You might have to have a reminder. I've done this at several organizations, and I've never had anyone do anything crazy. They put something kind of questionable on at one time, and it was just a simple, hey, maybe we shouldn't post things like that with that hashtag, and that was the end of the conversation. It was a one time out of hundreds of employees. So I think that as long as you can get through to your executive sponsor that this is important, that they'll back you up in the case of legal maybe having a problem with it. But it's very important to do. Um, 96% of companies believe employer brand and reputation can positively or negatively impact revenue, yet less than 44% monitor that impact. 80% of talent acquisition managers believe that employer branding has a significant impact on the ability to hire great talent. We just talked about people being attracted to your brand because of all of your employer branding initiatives. So employer branding can lead to filling jobs quickly since job seekers who are familiar with your brand will be eager to apply. Brand recognition will speed up the recruitment process. Candidates are more willing to respond to recruiters about positions within a company that they have heard of positively. And this is the effective people marketing part and the brand trajectory. So it goes from the first impression to the application, to the candidate experience, to the employee experience, to the alumni experience. So it goes all the way through the process. It doesn't stop anywhere, it keeps going. And back to Dan. All right. Hey, so Heidi, thank you for that information it was incredible and, and a lot of information in a very short period of time. Um, I want to cover this final slide, but I did want to say when we're done, we're going to be available for questions if anybody has any. Um, and then certainly because we've covered so much information, I believe we've recorded the presentation and we can share that back out with the group so you guys can get back through it and pull out any of these nuggets that Heidi shared with you. Um, but in the meantime, getting back to the slide. so. Where we started this conversation was that we wanted to meet the real George Jetson. Who's the worker of the future? What is uh, our workforce going to look like in 19 or in 2062? Um, we looked at 1962. We looked at today, um, and now bringing in back to to who George is and who we're going to be recruiting for in the future. Um, I think the real George Jetson is actually going to be a part-time worker at Spacely Sprockets. Um, he's going to be a highly trained, highly skilled coder with unique skill set that's absolutely invaluable to that organization. In addition, he's going to own a small web-based services company with his wife and a former friend of his or a high school friend of his. He's also going to be a consultant with companies outside of the, quote, sprockets industry um, and is available for project work or hourly engagements. He's a board member. He's a, he's a philanthropist. Um, George's specific uh, charity is Youth Sports, since he was a high school pitcher. Um, and Spacely Sprockets contributes to George's charities, which is one of the reasons why he's so interested and engaged in working for them. Um, George continues to take continuing education classes whenever and wherever he can. Sometimes that's seasonal, but more important, he's always looking to adapt, as we talked about, because that's going to be success for the future worker. And then lastly, he's a member of an online group of similar coders that discuss opportunities with each other and share challenges and help to, to uh, find solutions for those. Um, so again, I wanna thank everybody for, for listening to us today. Um, if there are questions, we can field those, or as I said, we will send out this recording to everybody afterwards so that you can get back through it and pull some of those great nuggets that Heidi shared. Thank you everybody for joining us and you can also find us on LinkedIn if you want to have a more personalized conversation 
um, where we'll be happy to set up either a phone call or just message through LinkedIn. Um, you can find Dan at Daniel da Davenport, correct, Dan? Correct. And you can find me at Heidi Howell Green. And thank you for attending.